Hey guys, I'm Georgia and welcome back for another episode in my mystery series, where today I want to focus on a very strange phenomenon within true crime, when people commit crimes and then in their defence claim that they were asleep. Yes, this is something that's happened multiple times in the past and I'm sure will happen again in the future. It's not a super common defence as it's incredibly hard to prove and comes with any number of caveats, but quite simply, people can't be held liable for crimes if they weren't conscious during them, can they? There's a long documented history of people trying to get away with just that, claiming parasomnia as the excuse behind their crime, that they were asleep and unaware of what was happening. And today we're going to be diving deep into the history of this defence, taking a look at what exactly parasomnia is and looking closely at some of these cases where it's been used as a defence. But first, I want to say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Magellan TV, an amazing hidden gem in the world of streaming services. It's the best value of any premium documentary streaming service in both price and quality, and is the highest rated documentary streaming app on Google Play. So if you're a fan of documentaries, this is the only streaming service you need. Magellan TV is all about the drama of real life and has the largest and best collection of true crime shows anywhere, focusing in on the quest for justice, famous unsolved cases, as well as on the other side of the coin, the justice system and what causes criminals to become criminals. This week I want to recommend to you a very relevant documentary and that's Sleepwalkers Who Kill. If you want a deeper understanding of what I'm going to be talking about in today's video, if you want more real life examples of this, then you have to go and watch this documentary. I feel like the premise of this one is quite self-explanatory by the title, but it takes a look at people who suffer with parasomnia to the most extreme of levels. The documentary features interviews with psychologists and actual people who've committed crimes in their sleep, and it ponders the big question, how do you separate the people who genuinely are sleepwalking from the people who are just pretending, using it as their alibi? Magellan TV add over 20 hours of new content every single week, 4K quality is always included in your subscription, and the best part, no ads ever, it's completely ad-free viewing. If you want to try out Magellan TV for yourself and watch Sleepwalkers Who Kill, then you can click on the link in the description box to claim your one month free trial. And seeing as we're now coming up to Christmas and just the general gift giving season, I also want to mention that Magellan TV offer membership gift cards available all year round, meaning that you can give the gift of documentaries and honestly, I can't think of a better present than that. It's a very easy gift with the fantastic added value of knowledge and you all know how I feel about knowledge. So first, what is parasomnia as a whole? Well, parasomnia is defined by the Oxford Dictionary as a disorder characterised by abnormal or unusual behaviour of the nervous system during sleep. But really, it's kind of a catch-all term for unusual behaviours that people experience either prior to falling asleep, while asleep, or as they're waking up. There are deemed to be six different types of parasomnia, some of which are more relevant to today's episode than others. So there's sleepwalking, which we've all heard of, and is known to affect about 4% of adults. This refers to any action performed whilst the person is technically asleep. It doesn't have to be literally sleepwalking. Extreme nightmares and night terrors are also both considered to be types of parasomnia. Then you've also got teeth grinding and nocturnal sleep-related eating disorder. That one's in the name, people eat in their sleep, which is incredibly dangerous. It can cause extreme weight gain, potential choking, you could cut or hurt yourself with kitchen utensils, or you could eat something you're allergic to. You're asleep, you don't know what you're doing. Then finally, there's REM sleep behaviour disorder, deemed to be much more extreme than your just regular sleepwalking, and this mostly occurs in males over the age of 50. This is possibly the most relevant type of parasomnia to this video. Sufferers are known to act out their dreams during REM sleep, which are often dramatic and or violent. Normally, for most people during REM sleep, the body experiences temporary paralysis of most of the muscles, which allows us to dream quietly and safely throughout the night. However, for people suffering from REM sleep behaviour disorder, this doesn't happen, and therefore you can physically act out your dreams. For some, this manifests in just more twitching or quiet sleep talking. For others, this can manifest in much more violent movement, shouting, kicking, punching or worse, especially if, as I said, the dreams themselves are violent. 
Obviously, this means that either the sufferer themselves or their sleeping partner or just anyone in the vicinity can be injured or worse as a result. But REM sleep behaviour disorder is relatively rare, it affects only 0.5 to 1% of adults and as I said mostly occurs in males over the age of 50 but it does come on a spectrum. It's going to be even rarer for people to suffer with a more violent form of this. But according to the Sleep Foundation, up to 60% of sleep partners have reported experiencing a physical injury. Often, REM sleep behaviour disorder coexists with other neurological symptoms, things like Parkinson's disease, Lewy body dementia, multiple system atrophy, narcolepsy or stroke. In a lot of cases, the sleep disorder precedes the development of one of these neurodegenerative diseases. According to one study, 38% of men aged 50 or older with the REM disorder would eventually go on to develop one of these diseases within 13 years. Subsequent research has found that 30% of individuals with the disorder develop Parkinson's or dementia within three years, and 66% did so within seven and a half. Again, according to the Sleep Foundation, the average onset age is 61 years old, with 87% being male. Despite all of this, little is known about how exactly these things are linked. We actually don't know all that much about sleep. It is thought that alcohol or certain prescription drugs can contribute to the sleep disorder and preventative steps can be made, as well as changes in your sleep routine and schedule, but there's no one cure-all. Of course, if you do have the REM sleep behaviour disorder, there are a number of steps you can take to ensure both your own and your sleep partner's safety at night. Things like removing sharp objects and weapons, placing padding on the floor and bed rails, even putting a mattress on the floor. You can also protect the bedroom windows, you can pad the sharp corners of furniture. This is a really serious disorder that can really cause injury for both the sufferer and their partner, or like I said, just anyone in the vicinity. So that's our brief overview of what parasomnia is, and maybe you've already got an idea of how somebody might want to use this as a legal defence, whether or not you're a genuine sufferer. So, let's dive into four of these parasomnia cases, starting with R.V. Parks, a landmark Canadian case from 1992, and probably one of the more famous parasomnia defences. Or actually, as all of the legal documents refer to it, automatism, which is the performance of actions without conscious thought or intention. The R.V. Parks case was a leading Supreme Court of Canada decision on the criminal automatism defence as to whether the condition of sleepwalking could be classified as non-insane automatism or whether it should be classified as a disease of the mind, a mental disorder. If the latter, any case deemed to be automatism could warrant a verdict of not guilty by reason of insanity. I don't know why I'm really struggling to say the word automatism, 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 so this is, we're going to be in for a wild ride here. This case originally began back on the night of the 23rd to 24th of May 1987, when 24 year old Kenneth Ken Parks got into his car and drove over 20 kilometres from his home in Pickering, Ontario, to the home of his parents in law in Scarborough, Ontario, after falling asleep in front of the TV. He last remembered watching Saturday Night Live around 1.30 am. While still asleep, Ken had managed to put his shoes on, find his car keys and leave his house, leaving the front door and garage doors wide open. This was very unusual in itself as Ken was militant about locking his front door. He then drove all that way 20 kilometres through the streets, a 15 minute-ish drive whilst apparently still asleep, before arriving at his parent-in-law's home. Once there, he picked up a tire iron from the garage and went up to the bedroom where he attacked Barbara and Dennis Woods. He struck his mother-in-law, 42-year-old Barbara Woods, with a tire iron and stabbed her four times, murdering her. Her husband, Dennis, was also stabbed and choked, but he would survive the ordeal. But Barbara and Dennis weren't the only two at home. Ken's teenage sister-in-laws were also there and they heard the commotion. They would report hearing strange grunts that would stop and start. Obviously, they screamed out, and around this time, Ken came out of his sleepwalking trance very briefly. He recalled waking up and seeing his mother-in-law's face and going upstairs to try and calm the girls down. Then, suddenly, he was inside his car, covered in blood, with a knife in his hand. At 4.45am, he drove straight to the nearest police station and handed himself in, saying that he'd killed his mother and father-in-law. 
The officers would note that Ken seemed to be highly agitated and very anxious. They obviously took him into custody and took him to the local medical centre as he'd badly injured his hands. It would turn out that he'd severed tendons on five fingers on both of his hands, but seemed to be completely unaware of any pain. He actually needed surgery on both hands and spent days in hospital before eventually being taken to jail and then to the Toronto East Detention Centre. By this point, he said he had no memories of what had taken place. He knew nothing of the murders. But of course, he was charged with first-degree murder in Barbara's case and attempted murder in Dennis's. Now, it's important that I give you a bit of context as to Ken's relationship with his in-laws, and you'd probably be forgiven for assuming that this was a very bad relationship considering what happened. But it turns out that simply wasn't the case. Ken didn't have the best bonds with his own family. He hadn't lived with his mum since he was 15, and he spent the last of his teenage years living with his grandparents instead. Then he met a girl called Karen Woods, who was a teenage runaway, and the two fell in love. He convinced Karen to return home to her parents and reconcile, which she did. So from day one, Ken was very much in the Woods' good books. They got married when Ken was just 21 years old and his in-laws essentially became his parents. They treated him as their own son and they spent a lot of time together. Ken was six foot five and 225 pounds, so he was a pretty large guy. Barbara called him her gentle giant. It was a very loving relationship from the very beginning. Only it would turn out that Ken had a bit of a gambling problem. As it always does, this started off very small and just spiralled completely out of control. He worked a pretty demanding job as a project coordinator, working 10 hour days more often than not, and then Karen fell pregnant. The gambling started as a way for him to just earn some money, to pay off some of the mortgage and be able to raise his daughter comfortably, but of course, it's never that easy. Soon, Ken found himself in serious financial trouble, and in a last ditch attempt to stop them from losing their home, he started embezzling at work, which just added more stress. Always a deep sleeper, somebody who really valued his sleep, Ken was now only sleeping for four to six hours a night before waking up early and heading to work. Then the baby was born in the midst of all this stress, and we all know that a newborn is never conducive to a good night's sleep anyway. March 1987, Ken's work found out about the embezzlement and he was fired, with them asking for all the money back in lieu of taking him to court. At this point, he has to come clean to Karen, who said they should sell the house, and she went back to work herself. But in all of this, he's still gambling, thinking that surely the next bet is going to be the one that pulls them out of this hole. Gambling is a particularly nasty addiction, because your problems are generally money-related here. And how can you potentially come into a whole load of money suddenly and fix all your problems? By gambling, by winning a big bet. It's this never-ending cycle. Ken did eventually end up getting help though, he went to Gamblers Anonymous after his health started to suffer. The weekend that this murder happened, he had plans to meet with both his and Karen's families to share with them what he'd been going through. But this stress and shame meant that on the night of the 22nd, Ken didn't sleep a wink. He was meant to be telling his grandmother that next morning, but couldn't bring himself to do it, instead deciding to do it the next day, and he went to play rugby with his friends instead. As you can probably imagine, Karen was furious when she found out about this. There was only so much she could take. The couple had an argument, and at 4.30pm, she went to work, leaving Ken with the baby, who he put to bed around 8.30pm, and then settled on the sofa himself, watching TV until Karen came home around 9.30, 10. Together, the couple watched TV until midnight. She went off to bed, but Ken said that he wasn't going to be able to sleep yet. He was too stressed. He was going to stay downstairs for a bit. And then, as I said previously, the last he remembered was watching SNL around 1.30am. And then, all of a sudden, he's covered in blood at the police station at 4.45am. And of course, Ken was thoroughly confused by everything that happened that night. The only reasonable explanation that he could come up with was that he was sleepwalking. He had been known to sleepwalk before, but obviously he'd never done anything like this. He would often wake up sweating after experiencing night terrors, he was a sleep talker, he never remembered his dreams. And considering everything I told you in the introduction, there's no denying that Ken's story here matches up with what we know about parasomnia. A man, albeit a young man, under high levels of stress and incredibly sleep deprived. Some sources even say that he may have been taking some sleeping pills to help with his insomnia. But as you can imagine, when he first made these claims about sleepwalking, nobody believed him, least of all the authorities. He was clearly just trying to make excuses for a brutal murder. 
But if he had done this with intent, why would he then immediately go and turn himself in? What would his motive have been? Like I said, Ken was incredibly close with his in-laws, there was no doubt about that. But obviously, prosecutors weren't about to accept a sleepwalking defence at trial. But the more investigators looked into the murder, the more likely sleepwalking seemed to be a genuine explanation. Experts conducted sleep tests on Ken and his EEG results came back as extremely irregular. It showed that his brain tried or wanted to wake up anywhere from 10 to 20 times a night. He was going straight from stage 3 sleep, which is our deepest phase of non-REM sleep, deep, deep sleep, to wide awake. This in itself can do very weird things to the brain. It was after these results that this theory started to be taken seriously. Sleepwalking often occurs in the first three hours of a sleep cycle, and if Ken did indeed fall asleep at around 1.30am and then hands himself into the police at 4.45am, that timeline matches up. Even in his cell, cellmates would report that he would often wake up in the middle of the night, sit upright and mumble for a minute or so before returning to sleep, something he would never remember in the morning. As well as all this, Ken did seem to be genuinely distraught by what he had done. He was remorseful and grieving his lost family as much as any innocent person would do. He fully cooperated with the investigation and wanted answers, and his wife Karen stood by him every step of the way. Ken's trial took place in 1989, and it was going to be a very difficult one for the defence team. They had to convince the jury that Ken was indeed asleep, and that that makes him innocent of the crimes. If you're sleeping, you have no control over what your body is doing, and it cannot be your fault. And I must say, the defence did their job really well. They pointed out that Ken was due to be having a very difficult conversation with his in-laws the next day, that they were on his mind. He received a knock on the head during rugby, he was a known sleepwalker since child, he was overall very stressed, and they also found out what was on SNL that night. The scene that would have been playing around the time that Ken fell asleep featured unusual amounts of violence, with Dennis Hopper screaming, if you're going to kill me, kill me like this, kill me like this, kill me naked. And it also showed a scene from Easy Rider which also featured a lot of violence. Ken likely picked up on this in his half asleep, half awake state, his brain incorrectly making connections that culminated in driving to his in-law's house and violently killing them. The prosecution, of course, had their counterpoints to this. How could Ken drive to the in-laws whilst asleep and not get in any accidents? Well, this was a very quiet time of night and he'd driven this route more times than he could possibly count. He was on autopilot and maybe he just got lucky that nobody else was on the roads. The prosecution also argued that most sleepwalking episodes occur within 10 to 30 minutes, way too short of a time for Ken to do all this. The defence replied that the drive was only 15 minutes and the attack itself took minutes at most. On top of this as well, the prosecution failed to find any motive for Ken to kill his in-laws. He didn't benefit in any way from doing this, nobody did, and he also didn't have any history of crime or violent behaviour, he was a stand-up citizen. After nine hours of deliberation, in a shocked people all across Canada, Ken Parks was found not guilty and was acquitted of both the murder and the attempted murder charges. People were outraged but this was to be a landmark case in Canadian legal history. The main debate, the main outrage here was whether or not this would set a precedent for others who were trying to get out of murder charges. Anyone could say they were sleepwalking when they murdered somebody, surely people were going to do this now. And if this was a legitimate defence, surely this counts as a mental disorder, shouldn't it be not guilty by reason of insanity? Shouldn't Ken have been put into a psychiatric hospital? In Canada, the prosecution is able to appeal the outcome of a murder trial, which did happen here, but in 1992, the Supreme Court upheld the acquittal, and in answer to the long debate over the sleepwalking defence, they also ruled that it would be up to the judge's discretion on a case-by-case -case basis going forward. After all, this is a very unusual thing to happen, and most smart people wouldn't use it as a defence because it's fairly easy to prove if someone is susceptible to sleepwalking or not or at least in Ken's case it was, with his EEG readings off the chart. Ken was acquitted based on his parasomnia diagnosis in the end. That's pretty much what it came down to, as well as the lack of motive. In RV Parks, it was held that it was not sleepwalking which created the state of mind in which a respondent found himself at the time of the incident, but sleep, and sleep is a normal condition.
However, many experts have disagreed with this over the years, saying that while sleep is indeed a very normal condition, sleepwalking is abnormal and should be considered a mental disorder rather than simply a sleep disorder. There are generally considered to be two types of automatism, two types of this defence. There's sane automatism and insane automatism. Here in the UK, the sane version results in complete acquittal if it's successfully pleaded, and insane leads to the special verdict of not guilty on the grounds of insanity, although the rules around this do differ from country to country. However, it's not always easy to distinguish between the two, and a lot of it is just up to human interpretation, which does tread a very thin line, especially in legal cases. Generally, it's considered that sane automatism is caused by some external factor, so a lack of sleep, sleeping pills, drugs, alcohol, etc. Insane automatism is considered to be if there's a continuing danger of it happening again, and it can't be controlled by external factors like making sure you get enough sleep and not drinking. But there really is a lot of grey area in all of this. Who is to say that autosomnia or parasomnia isn't a mental disorder? As some experts have pointed out, what if somebody is in, say, a state of psychosis and kills someone, but then they have no recollection of it afterwards once they're back in a more mentally healthy state? That person would undoubtedly be found not guilty by reason of insanity and confined to a psych ward for an indefinite period of time. What's to distinguish that from a case of sleepwalking where they kill somebody? How is it different? I don't have the answers here, nor any particularly solid opinion of my own, but this is the difficulty with the automatism defence and why it's such a touchy area of law. Experts simply don't have enough of an understanding of the human brain, of sleep in general, to provide any solid answers. In fact, in the US, use of the automatism defence has become so frequent that a Dr. Michael Kramer Bornman from the Minnesota Sleep Institute has even set up the world's very first sleep forensics lab to help settle cases where it's used. Since 2006, the sleep forensics lab has been involved with well over 400 medical legal cases, not only from the USA and Canada, but other countries as well, like Israel, New Zealand. We all know I love a graph and I found this fantastic graph on their website showing the subtypes of cases they've dealt with between the years of 2006 and 2017. And as you may be able to see, sexual assault is by far the largest category here, with 145 cases turned over to them for their advice. Then you've got homicide at 57, DUIs at 48, assault at 25, child abuse at 14, and so on. Interestingly, there's two cases of death certificates being amended under the parasomnia umbrella, which I would just love to know the full story behind. But let's move on to our second case study, which is another similar case, that of 59-year-old Brian Thomas from Neath, Wales, here in the UK. Brian and his wife Christine, 57, had been married for almost 40 years, and they were now retired, spending their spare time travelling around the countryside in their camper van. They were very much a couple living their best life. In July 2008, the couple found themselves in Aberporth, parked up in a car park for the night when a group of boy racers pull in and start racing around, doing donuts and handbrake turns, generally just being very rowdy boy racers. Unable to sleep with all this commotion and just feeling generally unsafe, the couple move the camper van to a different car park, that of the ship inn, and then they settle back down to go to sleep. However, Brian suffered with a sleep disorder, finding himself having a dream where one of the boys had followed them and broken into the van. He was fighting them off in his dream. And then he woke up, finding his arm locked around Christine's throat as she lay unresponsive. He'd strangled her to death. In a panic, he called 999 and told the operator, I think I've killed my wife. Oh my god, I thought someone had broken in. I was fighting with those boys, but it was Christine. I must have been dreaming. What have I done? Police officers soon found him outside the camper van in a deeply distraught state. At first, obviously, investigators were sceptical about the situation. I mean, this isn't something you hear about all too often. But all the evidence did point towards the fact that Christine and Brian were a loving couple. They enjoyed spending time with each other. They had a cruise book soon to celebrate their 40th wedding anniversary. There was no evidence whatsoever that this was a violent or emotionally fraught relationship. Friends and relatives all agreed that Brian had no motive to kill his wife, again very similar to the Ken Parks case. He gained nothing from the death. 
16 months later, in November 2009, the case went to trial, but this was another very interesting one, as here both the defence and the prosecution were kind of under agreement that Brian himself was not at fault, and it was indeed a very unique case. In the months beforehand, sleep tests had been carried out on Brian, and it was confirmed that he suffered from night terrors. The prosecution accepted that Brian should be found not guilty, he wasn't aware of his actions whilst he was asleep, but they did initially call for a special verdict of not guilty due to insanity. If the jury found this to be true, Brian could have been held in a secure psychiatric hospital. According to British law, this is a verdict that can only be determined by a jury, so even though everyone was in agreement early on that he was not guilty, this case still had to go to court. But continuing along the vein of this being an incredibly rare and unique case, the Crown Prosecution Service soon conceded that they didn't have any more evidence to offer at this trial. Prosecutor Ewan Jenkins said in a statement, We have a duty to keep cases under continuous review, and following expert evidence from a psychiatrist, it was suggested that no useful purpose would be served by Mr Thomas being detained and treated in a psychiatric hospital. There was never any doubt that Brian was the one who caused Christine's death, but evidence from experts on sleep disorders very clearly indicated that he should not be convicted of either murder or manslaughter. They go on to say that it was also found that Brian was coming off of antidepressants, which may have been a cause of the worsening dreams. They finished off by saying, We therefore have offered no further evidence and asked the jury to return a simple verdict of not guilty. I have never heard of anything like this happening in a court case before, the prosecution conceding in such a way, but it does make me very curious as to whether this happened in other cases, maybe that's a future video idea. Ewan Jenkins went on to say, I must emphasise that the circumstances of this case are almost unique in the UK, and there have been fewer than 50 instances recorded worldwide. It is only because of highly sophisticated tests carried out by sleep experts that Mr Thomas's condition could be confirmed. Our thoughts remain with the family of Brian and Christine Thomas, who have remained dignified throughout this difficult time. Of course, Brian's family was overjoyed when he was released, with his brother saying, he has always been a loving husband and a family man. This was a tragic, tragic episode and we are all very emotional. I can't imagine being in a scenario like this one. Even the thought of accidentally killing the person I love the most absolutely destroys me. My thoughts are very much with Brian and I really hope he's been able to forgive himself for this. It wasn't his fault and there's never been any doubt as to that. Although I personally haven't heard it, reports do say that after listening to the recording of the 999 call Brian made, no one could read in any question that this was all just a tragic accident. Everyone is in agreement that he bore no responsibility here. Studies show that as many as 10% of children in the UK suffer with night terrors, or the fancy name for them, Pava Nocturnus. Most of these children grow out of it, but at least 2% of adults carry on having these horrible, vivid dreams. Night terrors are on a whole other level to nightmares. Night terrors and other sleep disorders can be controlled with drugs, something which Brian said he was hoping to look into after his trial. And he also told the Sun newspaper that psychiatrists advised him that he's not ever to sleep with anyone in the same bed in future. A recommendation that does make sense, and I'm sure Brian wouldn't want to share a bed with anyone going forward. But it's difficult to come to terms with that nonetheless. Now, we focus a lot on parasomnia here, sleepwalking and night terrors. But did you know there's also something under the parasomnia umbrella called sleep-related sexual abnormal behaviours, known colloquially as sexomnia? This is also something that's been used as a criminal defence in the past in sexual assault cases, and it is a real thing. The question is whether it can be used as a genuine defence, can it be proven? Well, apparently so. As you'll come to see, sexomnia has been used as a successful legal defence before. This specific subtype of parasomnia is characterised by unusual sexual behaviours during sleep, of which the sufferer will generally have no recollection of when they're awake. The symptoms of sexomnia obviously vary from person to person, but it could be anything from masturbation, fondling, sexual noises, sexual movements, initiating sexual activities, sexual aggression, and even sexual assault. It's said to be three times more common in men than women, and often occurs alongside other parasomnias. It won't usually be a lone symptom. About 7% of referrals to sleep disorder clinics are accounted to sexomnia. 
Research around sexomnia has been very limited up to this point. The term wasn't even coined until the early 2000s, so we don't exactly have a whole load of information to pull from here. But it is thought to be triggered by a variety of environmental or lifestyle choices, or an underlying medical cause. Things like drinking alcohol, past or current recreational drug use, stress or anxiety, sleep deprivation, depression, shift work, or poor sleep hygiene. This doesn't refer to hygiene in the cleanliness sense, but instead the habits and practices that are conducive to sleeping well on a regular basis. Good, consistent, uninterrupted sleep. Of course, the implications of sexomnia can be incredibly complex. By its very nature, it can have a profound negative impact on both the sufferer and their partners. People with this disorder tend to have no recollections of the events. And is there anything scarier than genuinely carrying out behaviours outside your consciousness? According to sleepstation.org.uk, a review of 90 cases of sexomnia from nine different countries, including the UK and the USA, found that 82% of the offenders were male. About a third of these included reports of aggression and violence, and 14% of them resulted in legal proceedings. Sexomnia is formally recognised as a psychiatric disorder and has now been included in the DSM-5, which is kind of the diagnostic manual of psychiatric disorders. However, this does doesn't make cases of sexomnia immune from legal proceedings. Sexual assault is still at the end of the day a pretty serious crime. But sexomnia isn't something that's widely reported on, mostly because of the level of shame associated with anything sex related. But there's also a legal reason as well. It's a slippery slope of people realising this could be a genuine legal defence and therefore using it dishonestly in all manner of cases. Prosecutors and investigators must be able to understand and distinguish between intentional abuse and legitimate sexomnia. But how do you do that? How is that going to be possible? Experts say that both parasomnia and sexomnia are legal defences that should always be viewed with scepticism. It's got to be proven via testing and background. It's got to be closely scrutinised before anyone can be found not guilty whilst using these. It's honestly an absolute minefield and it doesn't seem like any country has fully figured out how to deal with this. Almost every country with automatism laws basically say it's up to judge or jury discretion. And so here we have our third and final case study, another Canadian case, this time known as RV Ludica. If you haven't figured out already, I'm going to be talking about sexual assault here, so you have been warned. This case comes from 2009 in a post Ken Parks Canada where the decision on the criminal automatism, automatism defence had already been made. So it's looked at by a case by case basis and decided by the judge. Jan Ludica was a 30-year-old landscaper back in July 2003 when he attended a house party in Toronto and fell asleep on the sofa, along with another female party attendee who fell asleep on an adjacent sofa. They had both been drinking, as usually tends to happen at a house party. The woman was woken from her sleep to find a man, Jan Ludica, on top of her, having sex with her, something which is many women's, all women's, absolute worst nightmare. In talking about the legal case that follows here, I don't want you at all to think that I'm minimising the woman who remains unnamed trauma. As you can imagine, this is probably one of the worst nights of her life and I really really hope that she got all of the support that she needed in the aftermath and that she's doing okay nowadays, at least as well as she can do. I just don't want it to seem like I'm dismissing the victim here because she is the most important person in the story, but we just don't know anything about her, we don't even know her name. And two things can be true, whilst the situation was obviously traumatic for the woman, it also seems to be traumatic for Jan, if this sexomnia defence is to be believed. And it was, he would eventually be acquitted at trial, which was to the disgust of many women's and rape prevention groups who felt like there had to be some level of accountability here. Jan said that he only awoke and became aware of what was happening when he hit the floor after the woman pushed him away. She said, who the hell are you and what are you doing? To which he simply replied, Jan. He went to use the washroom and found that he was still wearing a condom, which he'd put on before the assault. The woman made her way to Women's College Hospital where she would be treated for rape. Later that day, when Jan heard that the police were looking for somebody in connection with a sexual assault, he turned himself in and gave a voluntary statement. From the outset here, he acknowledged that he had engaged in non-consensual sex with the victim, but also said that he was asleep when it happened and he was unable to control his actions. 
Investigators would find that Jan had spent the night before the house party in question at a friend's home, drinking alcohol and consuming copious amounts of magic mushrooms, and he didn't get a wink of sleep. The next day, he drove back to Toronto where he had plans to attend another friend's party, and he arrived there about 7.30pm. He was said to have drunk around 16 drinks that night, anywhere from 8 to 12 beers and several other alcoholic drinks as well. In the early hours of the morning, having not slept at that point for over 22 hours, he fell asleep on the sofa in the same room as this woman. The next thing he remembers is being pushed to the floor. At the subsequent trial in 2008, the defence team would put forward the defence of non-mental disorder automatism, sane automatism, whilst the prosecution took the position that he had not established that his actions were involuntary and therefore he was guilty of sexual assault. The defence also said that if the actions were involuntary, insane automatism, then this would suggest that they were the product of a mental disorder and the accused should be found not criminally responsible on the grounds of this. At trial, an expert on sleep disorders, Dr Colin Shapiro, testified that Jan was acting without logic or reason when he committed the assault, putting forward evidence that he was sleepwalking and ultimately concluding that he was suffering from sexsomnia at the time. Although I couldn't find it explicitly stated anywhere, I can only assume that Jan underwent similar sleep testing to that of Brian Thomas and Ken Parks. Dr Shapiro said that the sex somnia was triggered that night by a number of factors. The alcohol, the drugs, a genetic predisposition, it was found that his mother and brother also both suffered sleep disorders, and sleep deprivation. The defence also brought forward past girlfriends who said that there had been similar incidents with them in the past in which he was definitely sleepwalking and unaware of his actions. And in the end, the judge accepted this defence, stressing that the medical evidence presented was very strong. He said that at the time of the assault, the defendant, Jan, was in a state of sane automatism and that his conduct was not voluntary. Therefore, he was acquitted of the crime and the judge also stated that the evidence did not fit the definition of a disease of the mind, so he didn't need to get a psychiatric evaluation. Which, of course, was not the verdict the woman, the victim, wanted and she swore to take this case all the way to the Canadian Supreme Court, which she eventually did. However, they also found that Jan was not criminally responsible for his actions. By this point, it was five or six years since the incident and it was found that Jan had adopted a lifestyle plan to ensure that nothing like this ever happened again, something that they called a well-thought-through relapse prevention plan. It was found that he'd been living in the community without any difficulty in the years since the assault. He'd made steps to reduce stress in his life. He had a maximum of two alcoholic drinks per week and he sleeps safely with no access to females who are not his significant partner. If he is forced to sleep near someone else, he makes his history of parasomniac behaviour well known. Importantly, Jan put all of this in place without ever being officially ordered to. He did it off his own back, which looked very good in front of the boards. At this point, he also agreed to get eight hours of sleep a night, not stay up late or attend parties late, and to absolutely not fall asleep at parties. But this is all at the expense of a very traumatised woman who in her eyes has experienced no justice from the assault that she suffered through. There are truly no winners in a situation like this or any situation involving intense parasomnia, whether that's physical or sexual. Whilst in the two parasomnia death cases I mentioned, the families of the perpetrators stood by them, knowing their character. We can't expect that from a surviving victim who was entirely removed from the perpetrator. She didn't know Jan, why should she believe the sexomnia defence? It does sound like defence anyone who committed sexual assault would use in an attempt to get out of jail time. I truly don't know how to justify a case like this, it can't be justified, it truly is just tragic on all sides. I mean, all of the case studies I've shared with you today have been tragic. You really don't want to find yourself on either side of this coin. And I think I'm going to actually leave this one here. It's been quite a heavy episode this week, so maybe go and watch something a little bit lighter next. I know I'm going to. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you have any of your own sleepwalking stories, please share them in the comments. Hopefully nothing as awful as any of these, and I will see you in the next one. Bye, guys.